Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hello. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm in a firm called Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are 56 of us, so we're pretty much a full service attorney. I do nothing but the elder law piece of that. Um, and we are in Central Mass. I do a lot of work in Central Mass and also Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. They, they don't really believe me when I go to Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, but I am working when I'm down there. Um, and with me is Dr. Michelle Ricard. Uh, Dr. Ricard has been uh, a, an, a, a doctor now for God longer than I've been a lawyer. She's been in for more than 40 years. I've been in for almost 40. Uh, uh, and she has a practice in central Massachusetts, does a lot of work with UMass uh, Memorial, which is UMass which, Healthcare, which is a system, um, but does, uh, does entirely geriatric care. So she's dealing with these kinds of issues all the time. Sandy Cordolby. Uh, is, has only been a, a registered nurse, on the other hand, for 30 years. So she's kind of the, the, the unskilled person here. Uh, but she, she uh, a few years ago, or, or actually for, for many years, worked with uh, the Visiting Nurses Association on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, actually coordinating, was, you were the clinical director? You were the clinical director. So she was dealing with these issues, and now she is a full-time, she and a partner, started a geriatric care management business, uh, Horizons, which, which is just terrific. We do a lot of stuff with them. So, the purpose of this presentation is to talk out um, the, the issues surrounding what, what, what sometimes gets referred to as end of life care, but that's really kind of not the term. You know, it's, it's, but it's, it's issues that folks may be facing who are, who are getting older, who are dealing with a lot of these kinds of issues. Um, and to be trying to get rid of some of the myths about this, uh, and to be talking about really three the three kind of documents that you sometimes see, one is uh, uh, health care proxies, which people see all the time, and the second is, is this thing called the five wishes. How many people here have seen the five wishes? Ah, so this will be good to talk about that. Uh, and the third is to talk about the most form. How many people have seen the most form? Oh, if you haven't seen the most form, you've got to know about this. Um, so we're going to talk about all those things and really kind of in the context of as a practical matter, what of these documents are useful? What of these documents really aren't that useful? If you've got a patient or a client or a person who is kind of dealing with some of these end of life issues. So I'm gonna start off with just a very, very, and by the way, these are my clients. They're, they're uh, Frank and Mary. Um, they live in their house. Um, they're, and, and, they're, and their goal in life is to stay in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. They have three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. My clients always get a laugh out of that because they remember Peter, Paul, and Mary, so they think that's funny. Um, and their goal is after they die that whatever assets they have are going to get divided up among the three kids. It's very straightforward and they keep re you know, close relations with their kids. And the question is if Mary is sick though, if she's not doing well, if she has dementia, if she has a disease that is causing her to be really sick and she may be needing um, to deal with that in the hospital, and she's not well enough to deal with that herself to make her health care decisions, what happens then? So now I have a quick poll or a quick question for you. What is a living will? Anybody know what, anybody, I shouldn't say anybody know what a living will is. That's stupid. What do you think a living will is? Because there are these various, there is no official definition. Anybody think, think what a living will is? Anybody want to, what do you think a living will is? Ah, you think it's a document, you, or you feel that it's a document that expresses what people would like to see happen specifically if they are incapacitated. And what, what is, they'd like to see happen like with their jewelry medically, or with their... Uh, medically. Perhaps financially, perhaps medically, perhaps a whole bunch of things. Right? Anybody else feel, have, a, have a different sense of what a living will is? Right? Yes? I think in some 
So do people use those terms interchangeably? Because in some states they may honor a living will, but in some states it's really a health care proxy. So that kind of gets to where I kind of wanted, wanted to go on that. So th thank you for that. Um, there isn't an official definition of what a living will is, but we all kind of have a sense of what we think it is. And what we think it is is what you said. It's a set of instructions as to how you're going to be cared for if you're incapacitated so you can't give those instructions. Right? So, so living wills, in general, with a very few exceptions that we're going to talk about today, are not enforceable in Massachusetts. They're enforceable in many states, these kinds of documents that give these kinds of instructions. And as a matter of fact, there was a big move to make them enforceable, and I'm so old that I remember that happening. I think it was in the 1990s. Big push in the legislature opposed by the Catholic Church. They were the major opponents of it based on this notion that people really can't predict exactly what the situation is under which they may be wanting to accept medical care or not accept medical care. It was just too complicated. And so they said, you really shouldn't be doing that, right? And so instead of that, what Massachusetts did was they adopted the health proxy statute, right? So what is the health proxy statute? It is a, it is a statute that, that, oh, by the way, this is what this is. This is health care proxy kind of 101. Um, they, they, they said, okay, what we'll let you do, what, or what we will let you do, that sounds awful if you're the legislator, what we will let you do. What we will allow you to do, right, is to say, instead of trying to predict the future and say, so what is my medical condition is going to be, going to be and if I'm in this situation, uh, I don't want you to do this, and if I'm in this other situation, I do, right? Instead, we're going to let you name somebody, your own special person, who, who if your doctor says, you are not capable of making a medical decision, can make that decision in your place, right? And that's a healthcare proxy. And we're gonna put some real constraints on that, on that though, because we wanna make sure that we're to the greatest extent possible leaving you with your freedom, right? And beyond that, we're going to say, um, so-called living, in your specific instructions as to how to be cared for, however, right, are not gonna be enforceable. What we will do is we will allow you to limit the power of your proxy to make certain kinds of decisions, right? But if your proxy can't make those decisions and you can't make those decisions because you're incapacitated, well, then we gotta go to the old way. And the old way was that when someone was incapacitated and you need to make medical decisions for them, you'd have to go to court. You'd have to go to probate court, go through this huge process, and then get someone appointed that person's guardian, right? So this was really a way of getting around that issue, right? Now, there are very basic rules about healthcare proxy. Uh, there are some other little rules, but I just wanted to kind of do the big ones because I just wanted to focus to give you this kind of context for all of this. Um, first of all, a proxy in order to be valid in Massachusetts has to be signed by two witnesses. Um, um, the witnesses can't be uh, the pro people who are named as the proxy. Um, they also can't be people who are in the medical institution in which you are getting in which you are. If my recollection serves, they can't be in any, any medical institution, but we were having this conversation with, uh, yesterday, unless, but the exception to the general rule about medical institutions is, unless they're related to you. So a blood relative who was also a nurse or whatever can also be a proxy. It has to be signed by two people. Um, every time you sign a new one, you've revoked all the old ones. So all these people who have gone to their lawyer's office and in the course of doing a package of documents, which includes this beautiful healthcare proxy, which we've drafted, and then goes to the emergency room a, month, a week later, um, and because they're incapacitated, of course, and they don't know what they're kind of doing, and so somebody says, so sign this, here's the healthcare proxy, which of course the hospital wants, because they want to know who to call in the event there's a problem at the hospital. And so you sign that form and it gets witnessed, and you've now revoked the other one, right? Automatically revoked the other one, which is in some lawyer's file, and everybody thinks it still exists, right? So, 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 so the, once the proxy has taken effect, or once the proxy is in existence, it hasn't taken effect yet. It only takes effect when an attending physician says that the person who signed the proxy is not capable, uh, uh, either physically or mentally, of, of making um, medical decisions. Right? 
Does that mean that person is incompetent to do anything? Well, we have these conversations in our office, by the way, because the question is, is that person therefore incompetent to write a new will, right? Or to sign a deed, or to sign a power of attorney? All these things that may be of real interest when people are really sick and they're trying to figure things out. In our sense in our offices, the answer to that is, no, that doesn't determine that. So the fact that you are incapable of making a medical decision, because medical decisions are pretty complicated, right, doesn't mean you can't do with some of these other things. But the bottom line is, um, the healthcare proxy law says if you're, if you're incapacitated, then, then the proxy steps in and can make these decisions, unless those decisions are limited in some way in the, in the, in the text of the document. But finally, a, an individual can revoke their health care proxy at any time, at any time, right? So I remember, I always go through this kind of little scenario. So, if you, so, you're, in the, so you're in the hospital room and, you, and, and you're in the bed and your proxy is there with you and the doctor is there. And the doctor says, I think we ought to do thus and so. And your proxy says, I agree. And you say, no, I don't want to do thus and so. Well, the doctor says, yeah, but you're incompetent, so the proxy has the is the decision-making power. But then you say, well, I'm revoking the proxy. Well, you can do that. You can do that. No matter how crazy you are, or apparently crazy you are, you can do that. And if you have said that, then the question of whether or not the proxy is revoked has to go to court. Right? Now, why would the, why would the legislature do that? Because the point of the proxy statute the point of all this is to maintain to the greatest extent possible the power of the individual to make their own health care decisions and to not have those over decisions overruled. In general, the presumption is going to favor the person who did the, the uh, proxy. So that's the health care proxy. And, and so the question is what should really be in that health care proxy? Before I started doing this presentation, I, I was looking at actually the one that we use, which, where we often have in the healthcare proxy, certain what I'll call end of life comments. It's really my desire that I not be resuscitated or that no intubation be used or that there be no fluids used in the event that it is determined by my doctor that I'm going to be in a permanent vegetative state, right? Or some other little things like that. As a matter of fact, I see it very commonly. There's a kind of a standard looking provision that says it is my desire that I not receive this kind of intubation. If I, can, if I can no longer um, uh, uh, recognize people and talk with them in a kind of a coherent way, right? Well, from the perspective of my clients, that's a terrible provision, right? Because my clients are typically people with Alzheimer's and dementia, right? They all have that problem. The notion, though, that they cannot or would not have wanted to live a, a, an otherwise happy life Right? Just because they can't do the New York Times crossword puzzle anymore, you know, and they can't recognize their, their spouse, and you know, that's a real question. So, so when you see that kind of language in a proxy, that's why we've moved increasingly away from putting any kind of language in there. Even though the proxy we say specifically says, this is advisory only. This is advisory only to the proxy, because we know that that's the case. It has to be advisory only. Otherwise, if, if a doctor saw that, they might say, oh, is this trying to limit the power of the proxy? Am I getting into all those other issues about limiting the power of the proxy? I don't know. I'm a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I better call our lawyer. And now everything kind of gets gummed up, right? So that's the proxy law. So what, what I'd like you to kind of think about, and that's valid, but remember living wills aren't valid. So in that context, 